Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. This morning, we are continuing in our Eastertide mini-series here on joy, and where we've been in the book of Philippians, all right? And uh, Pastor Aaron has started us off on the series here last week, and uh, we saw how that we could have joy even in sacrifice. And if you'll remember, we saw how, how God is calling us to a life of laying down the things that the world considers valuable and saying, along with Paul in Philippians 1, verse 7 and 8, Paul says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And so we saw there can be true joy in a life of sacrifice lived as unto the Lord. So the title of today's message uh, is Joy and Setback. So we talked about sacrifice uh, last week, and today we're going to be talking about how can we have joy in the midst of the setbacks of life. And when I think about that word setback, I think of, of every fall, right before winter comes, you know, uh, when we set back our clocks an hour. So we get rid of the, the darkness in the morning, but then it gets dark at like 5 o'clock, Right? And so we gain an extra hour of sleep for that one day, and we're really happy on that Sunday, but then we lose an hour of sunlight for like what seems an eternity. And I know many people, and I know I'm, I'm one of them, get really frustrated when we, we're falling back and then we're springing forward every year, because there, there are consequences that go along with having uh, fewer daylight and, and earlier sundowns. There was a, a survey, a, a government survey conducted by uh, YouGov, and they uh, they conducted a survey on the effects of daylight savings time, and according to the survey, 74% of Americans say a lack of daylight affects their mood and their productivity. Are you in that 74%? Is 100% of you in that 74%? There was a, a psychiatrist, Dr. John Sharp, at Harvard uh, Medical School who helped with the study, and he says that the darkness of winter really affects us and can cause people to be irritable, sleepy, and want to quit the day earlier. So even a little setback like that, just the amount of daylight we get, can really affect our moods. It can sour us. It can make us depressed. And as we dive into the book of Philippians here this morning, uh, we know that it's, just, it's not just the amount of daylight in winter that can leave us feeling down. There are really serious circumstances and setbacks in our life that may rob us of our joy. And there are different kinds of, of setbacks that we can experience. One can be uh, as a result of, of sin. Maybe we did some wrong choice, and so we, we experience a setback in life as, as a consequence of that, of that sinful choice that affects us. Or maybe someone else made a, 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 a choice that is affecting us and it's causing us to have a setback. But the type of setback I want to talk about today uh, is the unforeseen circumstances that God either places or allows to happen in our life, all right? So those are the ones that we want to key in on here this morning. And so because of those things that happen, uh, one of the greatest challenges that we face as Christians is, is the threat of questioning God's goodness when, when circumstances turn bad. That's one of the greatest challenges we have. When, when something unexpected comes your way, are you going to question God's goodness in that experience. And so one of our greatest needs then is to have uh, faith that God is in control over every aspect of our lives and he will even turn even, even the most aggravating setback that we experience into an opportunity for the advancement of the gospel and the praise of his glory. So the passage that we're going to look at today uh, is an, an astounding example of this very principle right here. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to see the Apostle Paul's reaction to the setbacks that he was experiencing in his life, in his ministry. And I know, I'm pretty sure we all know what a, when we say setback, we know what it is, right? It's, a, it's an obstacle to progress. It's something that happens that is not according at all to what you had planned, and it can cause panic. It can cause fear and doubt and even a feeling of defeat to, to creep in to our minds. And just to give you a little background of where Paul is when he's writing this letter to the Philippian church, he is a, a prisoner under house arrest, okay? So he's had a, a Roman soldier chained to him 24 hours a day 
for, for more than two years now at this point. And that seems like a pretty significant setback to me, don't you think? I mean, he, he's been called to, to spread the gospel message to the world, and the Philippian church is, is really concerned about him uh, and, and what will happen, what, what's going to happen to the progress of the gospel. Is the church going to fizzle? Uh, is, is it going to just disappear? Is Paul's ministry going to come to an end? And so all these questions are floating around, and Paul is, is kind of just stuck, and he can't leave this little rented house, this little rental apartment that he has, and, and he's in prison there. What can God possibly accomplish with his champion evangelist here in chains? And so we're going to look at what is, what is Paul's response to his circumstance? Is he unhappy? Is he overcome with panic? Is he overcome with, with fear and doubts? No. Paul says this, and this is kind of our, our three points here this morning. Paul says, my setbacks that have, that have been in the past, my past, present, and future setbacks uh, are really advances for the gospel. Okay? Those are our three points, and you can follow along in your, in your bulletin there, a little outline. My setbacks, past, present, and future are really advances for the gospel. And you can say, Paul, what are you talking about? <laughs> You're in prison. You, you aren't free to go wherever you want. You can't preach the gospel wherever you want to go. How can you say that the gospel is advancing? Well, let's read about it. Can you turn with me in, in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1? We'll start in verse 12 here this morning. Verse 12, and we're going to read all the way to, to verse 21. Verse 12 says, And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the gospel, the good news. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I've been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Our first point this morning is the gospel advances with past setbacks here. Okay, so Paul is looking back on all the things that have happened to him, and he's writing this letter to the Philippians to let them, let them know uh, how he's doing. And I think it's, it's very true sometimes, and a lot of times in our life, that things happen to us in our past that kind of set us back. They steal our joy. And you can have a plan, and then, and then something unexpected happens, and that turns that plan upside down, and it can even alter your course and cause you to have doubts and fears, and even it may affect even the future pan, the plans that you, that you might make later on in life. And you know Mike Tyson, uh, the famous heavyweight champion boxer, and I guess philosopher, <laughs> once said, everyone has a plan till they get punched in the mouth. And that's true. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. When something doesn't go according to how you planned it, even if it's uh, ministry-related, how did that affect you? If you can think back on all the things and all the plans that you've made, how did that, when you got thrown that curveball and that setback happened, how did that affect you? Did you feel down? Did you feel defeated? We're so jostled when setbacks come and punch us in the mouth, aren't we? We're so jostled. And perhaps you're still feeling the effects of a, of a past setback right now, and it's still stealing your joy. I believe that we can find uh, great encouragement here this morning in, in the life of Paul and the words of Paul uh, because he was a man that, that would not allow his joy to be taken from him. How did he do that? Well, he believed that his setbacks were planned by God. 
He believed they were planned by God. Let's look again at, at verse 12. He says, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me, everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. He's saying all the things that have happened in my life up to this point, it might seem like something that, that could steal my joy, but it's not. Do you know how many setbacks Paul went through up to this point when he's writing this letter? You can read through uh, Acts 21 to 25, and they're all right there. But I'm going to give you a, a quick like, highlight reel of, of Paul's setbacks all right, that he's referring to. So after, it's going to be like 20 seconds. After Paul's third missionary journey here, all right, he goes back to Jerusalem, and there in Acts 21, we see him in the temple, and some of the Jewish leaders see him there, and they're really upset about it. And so they cause a riot, and they attack him, okay? And so then this Roman soldier, he arrests Paul, not because he's, you know, trying to arrest him and, and cause trouble for him, but he's trying to protect him from the mob, okay? And so the Roman soldier takes Paul, and he's about to have him beaten up to, to kind of placate the crowd. All right, we'll, we'll beat him up a little bit, and that'll make you happy. But then Paul says, whoa, can't touch this. I'm a Roman citizen. So they take, <laughs> so they take Paul, and they still put him in prison, Okay, and so all through this judicial trial process, Paul's preaching the gospel and he's sharing his testimony with everybody that he comes in contact with, all right? He's in, he's in the barracks in Jerusalem, tells a story there. He's in Caesarea and he spends two years and he goes through three different trials before uh, the governor Felix, who he shares the gospel with. He goes before the governor Festus, who he tells his story to. He goes before King Herod, King Herod Agrippa, and he tells his story to him. And so after two years of, of trials and, and prison, Paul says, Ugh, I'm done with this. I appeal to, to have my, court, my case held before Caesar. Every Roman citizen had that right. They would say, okay, you're going to Caesar. And so he's on the boat going to Caesar. And, and up to this point, you might think, all right, maybe things are, are turning up. He's on this boat. He's going to Caesar. And then shipwreck. He gets shipwrecked. And he has to swim to shore. So he swims to shore all, all on his own, and rather than trying to escape, he makes sure that all the prisoners are, are still well accounted for and that they're, they're going to where they're trying to get to. So somehow, after all of that, Paul finally gets to Rome, and then he's put in jail again <laughs> under house arrest, and he's been there for, for about two years up to this point. So can you imagine that? Setback after setback. Paul's ministry is just getting hammered <laughs> and hammered, and, and the Philippian church is worried about him. And because you can tell, because he begins with, I want you all to know, guys, these are all the things that have happened to me, but you know what? It's all right. I still have joy in the midst of all this. Because all of those things, I mean, if I went through all those things, I would turn from this joyful, you know, mission-driven person to this gloomy, depressed, gloomy Gus, you know, in no time. But what's amazing about Paul here is this complete absence of self-pity. He's not sorry for himself. He isn't depressed. He doesn't make any attempt to, to generate sympathy for himself from the, the church that he's writing to. There's not even a, a single word of complaint. There's no griping about the Jewish leaders or the Romans. There's no resentment towards God. Yeah, I mean, there's no, Lord, why me? Why me? Why are you doing this to me? But rather, Paul looks to all that had happened to him leading up to that point, and he sees it as a divinely orchestrated setup. A divinely orchestrated setup designed by God to get the gospel into a place where it otherwise might not have never have reached. The gospel is going forth. He shared the good news of, of Christ everywhere he went, to governors, to kings, to fellow prisoners, to, to the Roman soldiers that were chained to him 24 hours a day in that, in that little house that he was in. Paul says these things aren't a setback. They're, they're, a, they're an advance. God planned these these setbacks for Paul to turn them into advances for the gospel, where the gospel was moving forward and overcoming obstacles. And, you know, obstacles are, are definitely a, a part of life, aren't they? We all, there's never, it seems like there's never smooth sailing. There's always some kind of obstacle that we're, that we're up against. But, you know, God can use the obstacles that you, have, that you have experienced in life to put you in a position that advances the gospel, that advances the kingdom of God. And this past weekend, uh, I just saw the new Avengers movie, and I'm not going to spoil it for anybody. But uh, I guess if I've, I've kind of always been into, into superheroes, even at, you know, as, a, as a young kid and, and growing up. And so if I had to choose 
which superhero that like I could be for like a day, I think it would be Superman, you know, because like you can throw anything at him and he can just take it, you know, like he can fly, he's bulletproof, he can absorb any blow and he can't be challenged except, except Superman's got one weakness, doesn't he? What's that weakness? Kryptonite, right? And it's not just like a little weakness where he like has a tummy ache, you know, like he, it cripples him. He folds when he's next to that little green rock or whatever it is, right? But you know what? Unlike Superman, our God has no weakness. Amen? Our God has no weaknesses, not one. When we totally commit our lives to him, he turns the setbacks in our lives into stepping stones for the gospel and for the kingdom to be advanced. As you look through scripture, it's always been the case. As you look through uh, the book of Daniel, the lion's den was not really a setback for Daniel. It was a stepping stone for the faith of the king of Persia. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego looked like they were going to be extra crispy in that fiery furnace. But God turned that setback into a great victory. Moses and the people of Israel, they had a big setback. There was a big Red Sea in front of them, and and Pharaoh's army was coming to to get them. But God, through Moses, said, watch the Lord rescue you today. Job, he lost everything. But look what God did. God turned his setback into a comeback. And today, Job's life encourages people uh, who are suffering more than any other book in the Bible. And I think the greatest example uh, of this principle is, is, is Jesus Christ himself, whose death on the cross appeared to be the end of, of the kingdom of God and any hope of deliverance or forgiveness, and yet Paul says in Colossians 2 that the cross was, in a gloriously ironic twist, the very means by which God defeated and humiliated the enemy and brought us freedom from guilt and condemnation. This is what God does, not just in the lives of Paul and Moses and, and Job and all of the, the Christian Hall of Famers, but in your life. He does it in my life as well. God doesn't want us to, to crumble up like Superman Uh, to kryptonite when setbacks come our way or when we allow them to continue to steal our joy for years down the road. Our past setbacks should look like shining examples of God's grace in our weakness. So Paul is is a prisoner here, but he knew that the Lord was using his setbacks and turning them into setups to advance the gospel like never before. So you might say, well, well what, what proof does, does Paul kind of give to us that validates this, this principle? How did, how did it happen in, in Paul's case? Let's continue to look here uh, at verse 13. He kind of gives two examples of how his situation was used by God for the advancement of the gospel. First off, his, his setback uh, of being a prisoner opened up a door for an audience of Roman soldiers, right? They, they could hear the gospel. They, belie- they were starting to believe in Jesus Christ, and God had a plan for that palace guard that Paul did not see before when Paul was making his plans. How many Roman soldiers do you think uh, went to, to go hear Paul preach uh, in, the, in the temple or in the, in the middle of the square? Probably slim to none, right? Probably none. But God used Paul's imprisonment as a setup for them to hear, to hear the gospel. Look again at verse 13. Paul says, for everyone here, everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. So God says, Paul, the Roman soldiers aren't coming to your Bible studies. So I'm going to force them through their jobs to, to come to you. And so when four guards are, are chained to you six hours at a time, they kind of rotated in six-hour shifts. Every time they rotate, you can share the gospel with them and tell them your story. And Paul did. And what do you think the Roman soldiers might have might have been uh, saying, or what did they see in Paul that, that caught their attention and then they went and, and shared about to their, their friends and their family and their, their fellow uh, soldiers? Was it his, his patience or his gentleness when he was treated harshly? His steadfast loyalty to the gospel? You know, I can't help but imagine with each changing of, of the guard there, there were these like comments and, and conversations between the guards like, you know, this guy Paul, He's not like any of the other prisoners that we have. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't complain. He doesn't curse his God. 
He doesn't threaten Rome. He sees this whole experience as an opportunity to, to share with us about this carpenter from Nazareth named Jesus who says he's the son of God. And I'm not exactly sure about, you know, everything that he's saying, but watching Paul have such joy under such crummy circumstances kind of makes me a little curious about this Jesus that he serves. You know, there's no greater or more powerful witness of Christ than that which comes through our suffering or when we experience adversity. When it's easy to be a Christian, when everything's smooth sailing, not a lot of people are going to notice. It's only when according to the world's standards, when they think that it should be a time when we should be giving up or becoming bitter or, or falling into despair, and we instead make Christ known with joy despite our setbacks, that the gospel advances. And unbelievers take notice. They're drawn to it. And maybe we need to kind of just pause here for a moment and, and take inventory of our, of our own situations. Think about the most inconvenient circumstance or trial or, or setback that, that you have faced. And ask yourself this question. This is a hard question. Would anyone be interested in Jesus after having watched my reaction or listened to my words while I went through that circumstance? Would anyone be interested in Jesus watching me from afar going through that circumstance? That's a tough question to ask. How is my reaction to the setbacks that I experience in my life? Are my circumstances stealing my joy? Are unbelievers in my life noticing? And praise God, That Paul saw his setbacks as the way that God saw fit to bring the gospel to the Roman palace guard. What an advance for the gospel. The whole palace guard knows that Paul is in prison for Christ. And some of them are believing. Some of them are getting converted. Okay? So he sees this as God planning this to to preach to to the palace guard, to share his testimony, to share the gospel. And then another way that the gospel is advanced because of Paul here being in prison is that the other Christians in Rome... They're following Paul's example, and they're they're beginning to start to speak more boldly in their faith. They're not having fear about about sharing their faith. Look in, in verse 14. Paul says, And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. So fellow believers, they they could come in and visit Paul. So they they would come in and visit him in his in his house. And since there weren't, any, there weren't any seminaries or Bible colleges back then, they would go to the great theologian himself, the Apostle Paul, and they'd go in and he would teach them, he would pray for them, and he would be praying for the, the Roman soldier that's ch- chained to him and listening to the whole uh, Bible lesson that they were going through. And so when the, the Christian brothers would return home, I, I imagine in their conversations with each other, they would say, did you see how that Roman soldier was listening and, and God opened his heart? Like, God is blessing Paul in this circumstance, and he's, he's being bold. I can do that. And so all the other Christians are, are coming and being bold in their faith. So instead of dwelling on our setbacks that we uh, experience we, and allowing fear and, and doubt to kind of fester in our minds, we need to reach out for God's grace and be bold to share Christ and display Christ to those around us. And we can all think of, of a past setback that, that uh, has been placed in our life or God has allowed to be in our life? What's yours? What is the, the, the setback that you have experienced? Paul's was, was prison. He looked back on, on what had put him there in the past, and yet he didn't regret how things turned out. He didn't regret it. He rejoiced in it <laughs> because the gospel was being spread. What's your, your setback that, that uh, happened in the past that you wished that you could change? Maybe God, you know what? Maybe God is turning your past setback into a mission field. Maybe you saw your, your parents get divorced. Maybe you had a, a bad childhood or you grew up in a, in a rough, uh, with a rough life. Whatever the setback is, God wants you to, he wants you to use you in it to advance his gospel kingdom. And you know, Jesus, he died for sinners, right? There are so many people who are lost and without Jesus, and hurting, and need someone like me, someone like you, to listen, to give them hope of, of forgiveness and eternal life in Jesus. Maybe you know someone who's going through something that, that you yourself have experienced in the past, and you can be a great help to that person, and point them to the hope that is in, that is in Jesus. 
God is in control of our past setbacks, and he wants to use them in our lives. He wants to use them to advance his gospel kingdom to the world around us, okay? So Paul sees that, that his setbacks were in advance, his past setbacks, and now he says that is his present setback. The setback is not over for Paul. <laughs> Seems to always be in it, okay? So not only does the, the advancement of the gospel shape how we, how we view our past, but it also shapes how we evaluate our, our, present, our present circumstances here. So Paul's in jail, right? He can't do anything about it. He can't do anything about it. And at that time, there were other Christians in the church who were preaching Christ, but some were preaching uh, with wrong motives. They were envious of Paul. They were jealous of him. They saw him as a, as a rival. And so they were preaching kind of to puff up their own, uh, they, were, they were promoting themselves as they were preaching. But you know what? Paul's not bothered by it. <laughs> Look again at verse 15. He says, it's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I've been appointed to defend the good news. But those others, they don't have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful to me. And so often when, when faced with setbacks, with hard circumstances, Paul sees what's going on and it's kind of like, oh, that could really cause me to just have a negative attitude to those other people. Like, why are they doing that? And, and when we find ourselves in the middle of a hard circumstance, uh, we, we tend to want to kind of get ourselves out of it, right? We're praying to God, God, just get me out of this, this place. And Paul definitely could have, have done this, but you know what? God was not interested in getting him out of where, <laughs> where he had placed Paul. God's thinking is, is very different than ours. We assume that to be an effective witness, we need to have the right circumstances. God, I'll, if you get me out of this situation, I'll, I'll be effective for you. But you know what? God is, is less focused on trying to change our circumstances, and he's more focused on, on us displaying Christ wherever we are. You would think that if God wanted to defend the gospel, at least he would want to get Paul out of prison, like get him out there and, and let him defend uh, the, the faith and what, what these guys are doing and, and that it's wrong. And from the outside, Paul kind of looks like he's just been put on the shelf right? He's on the sidelines, and other Christians are, are preaching the gospel, but they're kind of doing it, some of them are kind of doing it to, to promote themselves, and they're probably gossiping about Paul and, and saying, like, Paul must have sin in his life. That's why he's in prison. Or, you know, he's, he's had a lot of success in his ministry. He's probably compromising the gospel somehow. Or Paul's not as articulate as our pastor. And so they're saying all these bad things about Paul, but notice what, what Paul says in verse 18. He says, you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether their motives are, are false or genuine. The message about Christ is being preached. So I rejoice. I rejoice either way. And so what controlled Paul's reaction to that situation? Well, he looked to the, God, uh, the, the sovereignty of God. He looked to God's sovereignty, the fact that God is always in control. It didn't bother him because he knew God had it all, all in control. You know, Paul had great plans of evangelizing uh, the known world. He, he was planning to go on from Rome and then go to Spain and Gaul, Gaul and, and the frontier lands of, of Britannia and Europe and just go all across there where pagans sat in darkness. But he had this setback here. He was in chains. He was stuck in Rome. And I think I would be tempted in that situation to just question God's ways or complain about being forced to, to sit on the sidelines or even let bitterness kind of creep in to my heart. But not Paul. He knew his chains were divinely planned by God and he knew that God didn't make mistakes. He knew that God was in control of the situation. And that's not just true for, for Paul's life or, or special Christians. It's true for every believer. God is in control. Do you believe that? Do you believe that in your life, that God is in control of all of the things that happen to you? Each and every believer, he, uh, Paul went on to say in Romans 8, 28, that Eden beautifully said for us this morning, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. God is in control, and he's using the setbacks that we experience in our life. He, he's using it to, to shape his people with those setbacks. You know, the prophet Isaiah uses the analogy of God as, uh, as the potter, right? God is the potter. We are the clay. 
the pressures of life, the setbacks of life are the hands of the potter who is also our father who loves us, shaping us into what he wants us to be. God uses the setbacks in life to form us to be able to do what God is calling us to do. That's what he does. So the most unforeseen circumstances, the most agonizing pain, the most confusing of situations can all be turned by God to his greater glory and the ultimate good of his people, which is to be more like Christ. And so I want to give you a a very small example. Uh, This is no Paul example here, but it happened in my life recently, and it happened here, so I'll share it with you. (laughs) This spring, uh, the choir was, was preparing our Easter musical, right? And last year, we put on this big production with sets and actors and and lights and everything, and and it went really well. The community responded uh, very positively, and God was using it. He was using it to work in people's hearts. And so I said, all right, let's let's do that again. Let's do another one of those. And so I put all of this effort into this musical. I was thinking, all right, here's all the options we have. I chose this one, and I... It doesn't really have like a a script. It's more for just like narrators and choir. And so I expanded the script and we did all this stuff and uh, put all this effort into this musical. And for whatever reason, uh, lots of people were were busy and I'm not faulting anyone here. Uh, Different seasons of life were busy, but we weren't getting the amount of uh, drama help that we needed. So it looked like, all right, well, we're not going to do the big full-blown musical this year. Okay, full-scale drama. And at first... I was a little disappointed. I kind of saw that as a, as a setback, you know, like, oh, we're trying to do this big thing, we're trying to accomplish this big thing, but it's not, it looks like it's not going not gonna to work out. But as I spent time in, in prayer about it, the Holy Spirit, you know, assured me, Jeff, don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. And so I, I kind of, as I, as I was praying more, and I kind of came around to, you know what, you're right. It's going to be fine. And it was meant to be more of a cantata anyway with narrators and, and choir. And then as, as I look back on it, as I look back on that Easter Sunday evening and just what a beautiful time of worship that we had and celebration as we, as we retold the Easter story from those three different perspectives. And then as after, uh, after Pastor Sean shared with us that next week about uh, little Nathan after the, after the cantata giving his, his life to Christ, it was just, it was totally worth it. Right? It was totally worth it that God, that even one child would come to Christ. It was totally worth it. And I don't even know why I was dwelling, uh, even for a moment, on what looked like a, a, a minor disappointing setback in that situation. God orchestrated it all to use that, that cantata in our, our little choir to, to click the, the light of the gospel into Nathan's mind, and it was totally, totally worth it. Praise the Lord. Paul knew that God was in control. And God is sovereign over our setbacks as well. And not only did Paul look to God's sovereignty, but Paul looked to his his salvation, God's salvation. In verse 17, when when Paul is speaking of those Christians who were preaching Christ but out of wrong motives, he wants the Philippian church to understand that, that the good news of the gospel, when preached, has the power to save and transform the lives of sinners. Okay, Even if the message is coming from From lips of those who are sinfully motivated, the saving power of the gospel lies in the message, not the messenger. Okay? He wants the Philippians to know that that the gospel is still being made known, and in that he rejoices. So what ultimately matters to Paul is not what these other Christians think about him, but what they say about Jesus. And so I think that is such a uh, an important thing for us as well. Our own comfort or our, our hurt feelings or our reputations All of these things are insignificant compared to the advancement of the gospel. We don't have to be defensive if other people are are critical of us or of EMC uh, and the way that we embrace and pursue our calling as a church. Our only concern should be, are we faithful to the gospel? Are we faithful to living out God's word? And I think even more importantly, we in turn shouldn't be critical of of other churches uh, around just because they don't worship like we do or because they're, they're different in other aspects. I mean, we can still have discussions about uh, philosophy of ministry and church government and all of these other things, but something else is far more important. If they're preaching the same Jesus that we see in, in, in the gospel, as we see in, in scripture, 
then rejoice. <laughs> Be thankful that the, that the gospel is, is being pushed forward. So brothers and sisters, this morning, we can have joy. We can have joy in the midst of setbacks because we can trust in the sovereignty of God. He knows what he's doing. Can we say that? God, I trust you. I know that you know what you're doing. And you're shaping me into the image of Christ through these setbacks that happen in our lives. And so we can rejoice as we look to God's sovereignty, as we look to the salvation that is being uh, advanced. And he's going to use you, he's going to use those around you to further the gospel. And so our, our final point here this morning is, uh, we saw is that, the, that the gospel advances through past setbacks and present setbacks. And so now Paul turns uh, to the future. And he says, all of these things that are happening to me and all the setbacks that have happened, and in them I have joy, so what's the worst that could happen? Let's look at verse 18. Paul says, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, they will lead to my deliverance. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or I die. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. So Paul is, is, uh, is thanking the Philippians for praying for him, and he's praying for deliverance. And he says, you know what? I'm confident that I'm going to be delivered, that God is going to deliver me. But even if he does it, I am content with either life or death. Paul says, I'm not afraid of the future or any other setbacks that I may encounter here. And whether I live or die, I want to honor and glorify Christ. You know, it's hard for us as, as Christians in America, I think, to connect with dying for our faith. We just, we can't, we can't connect that in our minds. We have a hard time dealing with death in general. I think it's almost like we're embarrassed of it or something. Like a couple hundred years ago, you know, when, uh, when Americans, they all either lived really close to each other or even in the same house, all the extended family, and, and then uh, children would have to grow up, you know, watching their grandparents or their par- great-grandparents pass away, and they had to deal with it there, like in the home. But nowadays, you know, people more often than in the home, they're, they're dying in the hospital, and then their bodies are rushed off to the, the funeral home, and the embalmer dresses them up and make them look very lifelike. Almost like they're, and I think that we're, we're almost em- embarrassed of, of death there. And so it's hard for us to, to cope with that. And I, I think death is the, the worst possible setback for those who believe that life is all about accruing pleasure. If life is all about pleasure here, if, if uh, you know, many Americans, I think, see the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to mean I need to get as much stuff as I can and, and live for my, my own self and my own desires and put off death as long as possible because there is no life after death. That's kind of the cultural standard. That's what our culture is, is saying. And because of that, I think it's very tempting for believers to kind of buy into that, that there's, there isn't life beyond the grave. And if we aren't careful, we can be tempted to, to cling to our material possessions for the security that they can give to us or keep us from risking our lives in the service of God. And so it's hard for us as Americans to, to, to think about dying for our faith. But you know, many believers around the world, on the other hand, have learned Paul's perspective on death. And they, like Paul, they provide an example for us in the West uh, for, for what it means to, to be content with, with dying for your faith. There was a, a Christian man from Iran named Mehdi Dibaj, and he was imprisoned uh, in, for, by the government there in Iran in 1984 on charges of apostasy because you see, he had converted from Islam to Christianity. And the penalty for that crime, according to Islamic law, was death. And so Mehdi suffered in prison for about 10 years, even before his case came to trial. And when it did, he had a, a written statement of defense, and it was very simple, and it was very straightforward. And I'm going to read uh, the last few lines here of Mehdi Dibaj's statement. He says, Jesus Christ is our Savior. And he is the Son of God. To know him means to know eternal life. I, a useless sinner, have believed in his beloved person and all his words and miracles recorded in the gospel 
and I have committed my life into his hands. Life for me is an opportunity to serve him, and death is a better opportunity to be with Christ. Therefore, I am not only satisfied to be in prison for the honor of his holy name, but I'm ready to give my life for the sake of Jesus, my Lord. So on December 12th, 1993, the court in Iran sentenced Mehdi to execution. But under intense pressure from, uh, from Western influences, including the, the U.S. State Department, they, they knew about the case, and so they were pressuring the Iranian government to, to, to let him go, and finally they gave in. They, they released uh, Mehdi in January of 1994. But then seven months later, he was found dead in a, in a park in Tehran under suspicious circumstances. And many believe that the government was, was involved. And he was the third Christian murdered in Iran after being released from prison. The test of faith that Paul experienced nearly 2,000 years ago is still a reality. It's still a reality in the modern church today. We, we don't really experience it here in America but if we are to be as faithful in our commitment to the gospel and to the church as Paul expected the, the Philippian church to be, we need to be aware of, of the needs of our suffering brothers and sisters around, around the world. Pray that God would give them uh, an extra supply, an unusual abundance of his Holy Spirit, and learn from their single-minded devotion to the gospel in life and in death. So the absolute worst thing that could happen to you, what is it? is it? Is it death? Paul says death is a victory for us, right? No matter what happens in life, I will honor Christ. I'm going to be a messenger of the gospel. And in death, I'm going to be with Jesus. <laughs> what could be better than that? I think we need to have a, a Philippians 1.21 outlook on life. And what about you here this morning? If, if you don't know Christ, if you have not turn to him for salvation, then death is going to be your greatest setback. The greatest setback you could ever experience without, without Jesus in your life. If you're without Christ today, I would plead with you, come to him today. Believe that he, he died for the, your sins on the cross and he, and he rose again from the, from the grave. So your sin, that's your, your selfishness, your pride, your rebellion against God is, is separating you from him. There's a rift between you and God. But Jesus, he died to make you right again. So believe on him and, ex and, and receive the salvation that he offers. So in conclusion here today, uh, as, as a Christian, you do not have to worry about, about the past setbacks that you've experienced. You don't have to worry about the present setback that you are in right now. And you don't even have to worry about any future ones that you will experience, even if it means that you are that you're going to die, to die for your faith. You don't have to worry about it. You can have joy in the midst of all of those things. Because whatever you're going through, God has, has put you in a place to set you up to glorify him. So honor him. Honor him in all of your circumstances. He's sovereign in your setbacks. And any setback you encounter there is, is an opportunity to advance the gospel kingdom for God's glory. To shape you. God is using those things to shape you into what he is calling you to be which is more like his beloved son. So remember, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 16, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Amen? Do we believe that? I will build my church and all of the powers of hell will not conquer it. God is in control. He has no weaknesses. He will not be defeated. So let your setback be uh, a mission field. <laughs> let your life be a, a shining Billboard, like our sign on Route 17, shining uh, and pointing to God's all-sufficient grace. And remember, Paul didn't just rejoice in God's sovereignty when, when everything was going right. Remember, he, he lost everything, his freedom, his high-profile platform. He lost his possessions. He lost his reputation. And yet, he knows he's precisely where he is because God placed him there. And he says, I will rejoice and will continue to rejoice. And I pray that you and I can have and, and we can say the same thing when we, we face setbacks in our lives as well. Can we pray together? Let's pray. Father, you are good and you are in control. Lord, when things happen in our lives that, uh, that confuse us, that cause us to, to spare, that cause us to, to panic, we pray, Lord, 
uh, that you would remind us that you are sovereign. You are not pacing back and forth uh, in, a, in a panic yourself, Lord, in your throne room. You are seated on the throne, and you are uh, sovereign and, and in control and exalted, Lord, above all else. And so we pray that we might uh, be like Paul, Lord, that we might have the mindset of Paul, that we might have the mindset of Christ, who had a, a, a great setback in, in, in dying for us, but we know that he knew, Lord, that you had, had placed him there and had, had put him there uh, to, as, a, as a great stepping stone, Lord, to bring many back to you. And so we thank you, God. We pray that you were honored and glorified this morning. And now bless us as we enter into a time of communion. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.